So what I wanted to do is kind of continuation of uh, what we did the last time. So as a, oh wait, there won't be. So this is what I've done. Um, and so we look, used the Sage method to analyze uh, simple harmonic oscillator, especially the damped simple harmonic oscillator. And um, let me just have the right sections rather not this one i'm just using the link to get so your textbook does cover what they call forced oscillations and this is the kind of thing where getting a mathematical solution can be super challenging um, so your textbook describes what a forced oscillation is um, they imagine this is a scenario where this is the driving source and it um, it has some frequency, either resonance or lower or higher than resonance frequency. Um, uh, here, there's even damping. <laughs> and, uh, and this is the equation of motion for the setup that they come up with. And, uh, and <laughs> if this looks complicated, that's because it is. It is. Um, not only it has this uh, first order term that introduces challenges when you're trying to guess the solution to it, it also has this uh, function with the explicit time dependence that makes things even more challenging. And uh, so that's why your textbook doesn't even attempt it to solve it, gives you a solution and uh, in terms of some parameters that they will uh, also just give to you rather than driving, because all this is very uh, mathematically complicated. And and what I think we can do using Sage Math is explore this setting uh, with more depth and with more interactivity. So I'm going to continue on from what I was doing last time. So, oops, I thought I started it. Oh, let me <laughs> restart. So this is um, my Sage Math thing that I was using before. Let me access it at localhost Discord. Um, and just to run it. So to get us uh, at the end of our last lecture, let me do this. I'm just going to sell, run everything. Uh, that'll, well, was this already running? I wonder if, uh, you know what, let me do it this way. I'm just gonna say kernel restart. <laughs> and then, we will just uh, run everything, run cells, uh, all starting from the beginning. Then it'll just uh, run through everything. Um, Jupyter notebook knows what's input, what's output. Um, so it just runs everything in sequence. And the way I organize this notebook, when I do that, it works fine. I put the cells in the correct order so that um, any error messages I had the first time around, they're not around anymore. So I'm just gonna um, start from where we are last time. So. We do damped simple harmonic oscillator. What we've done was we've, um, yeah, now let's look at damped simple harmonic oscillator. We've defined an additional variable, I and I. We defined the um, um, a new differential equation that models the damping parameter as well. So we're going to do the same thing here. We'll just uh, um, write down a second differential equation copy over what the textbook has um, for their differential equations. So I have, um, let me just to rewrite this whole thing so that it has the form of the textbook's version. Uh, equation D2 is equal to minus K times X minus B times deriv first to derivative of X with respect to time plus uh, the forcing term F naught times the sine of omega times T is equal to N times second derivative of X with respect to time. Now, one thing I have to be careful about is um, there are new parameters being introduced, F naught and omega. So let me, um, let me define those as variables, F naught and omega, or declare them. So that should be it for my equation. Yeah, no complaint. <laughs> so uh, so let's try solving. Um, so what we did the next step is we, um, 
Uh, oh, um, I think uh, where we ended the last time is we ended with an over them to case. So let's uh, go back to the under them to case because I have a feeling that's going to be more interesting than over them to case. So um, un under them to case. Um, and I'm going to have it forget previous assumptions. And then we will solve, right? Yes. Um, oh, the story is different variable. Uh, let me see if uh, I can get away with not changing any of this, maybe. Let me just give it a try. Oh, it worked. All right. Now this is looking formidable enough as a mathematical expression that I don't want to do anything with it in symbolic terms. But what I can do is I can plot it. So let me get the parameters I used to plot it before. And uh, I'll have the same issue um, as above, which is that I have two new parameters that I need to uh, plug the numbers of. And, it's kind of easy thing to just uh, start out with one. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't want to say that's what you should do every single time. Uh, it's, uh, um, it, it's an easy thing to do because uh, really all I, at a first order, all I want is I want these uh, symbolic parameters, uh, F that appears, so, oh, F not, F not that appears here. I want this uh, symbolic parameter to be no longer there. Like that's basically what I want. So uh, there. And omega is a more meaningful quantity. Um, let me do explore exploration with that in a little bit. So let me run it. Oh yeah, it gets something. And now as you look, oh wait, <laughs> that's not right. Solution D2. Yeah, I need to plot a different variable. Okay, it gets me something that as you look at it, you might be wondering, hey, this looks nothing like what they said the solution was gonna be. So they said the solution was gonna take this form. And what we have here is nothing like that. The amplitude is changing over time. And the difference is, so the solution that they're trying to describe here is the kind, a kind of a stationary solution. So. Uh, so you can see these transient behaviors at the beginning. With each cycle of oscillation, you see amplitude building up. So you might wonder, hey, does this build up forever or does it stop at some point? Let me um, triple the amount of time and say, ah, okay. This oscillation does um, reach some kind of asymptotic value of oscillation at some point. And that's what they are plotting here. So if I had plotted something like from time equals 100 to 150, then okay, what I get now kind of resembles what this looks like. The stationary solution uh, does resemble that. Um, so, okay, so that's uh, interesting. And so the one advantage of having something like this is to just uh, um, um, uh, play with it. <laughs> you quite can't fight uh, when you, um, uh, when you um, uh, when you just have it as a thing on a textbook, so let me do that. Uh, is there a way to go full screen mode? No, no, no. Um, so okay, so this is a uh, one and one um, answer for one set of parameters, and it's a somewhat you know randomly chosen. So I want to try running a, a second set of parameters. And uh, I've connected a second window to the currently running notebook. So I can actually do this. I'm just gonna have this on the side here so that I have that um, there. And I'm just gonna plot something different. So let's imagine, so we put in value of omega equal to one. Is that a special value? Let's try omega equal to two. See if what we get is different. Oh, it is different. Um, for one, it uh, why is it going down over time? Hmm. Interesting. I guess um, 
it it also has to do with this uh, um, parameter here. I think the way we set our initial conditions when we are solving this, we set the initial position of the oscillating mass to be at this a equals one value. And I wonder if it were, you know, a, at a equals one value. And I wonder if that's uh, unnecessary because uh, for with this oscillation, we have a driving force. So it might not be necessary at all to have uh, initial amplitude. It, it, to, it might be okay to have zero initial total energy because our driving source will be putting in energy. So let me get a new solution with that new initial parameter. Yeah, we don't get a uh, um, trivial solution. We get something that definitely looks not trivial. Let me rerun this to see what it will do. Okay, this looks uh, pretty here, if anything. We are starting from zero, and it's building up this amplitude under that oscillating force. I think I prefer that. Thing. So let me do that and see what this looks like. Um, so initially, it should show up that way. And then... Guess it is one function. Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, let me try something different. Um, I wonder if uh, the it's uh, not quite behaving the way I'd like it to. So our driving force, we could model it as a sine. We can also model it as cosine because um, it's a matter of what initial, at time equals zero, what does your force look like? So with this equation at time equals zero, we'll be starting out with a maximum amount of force. I somehow find that set up more natural than what we had before. Let's give that a try. Okay, nothing funny there. Let's give this a try here. Uh, all right. I, I mean, it's a, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, uh, uh. So um, one thing we can definitely see is something different is happening with omega equal to one and omega equal to two. Uh, let me try getting something different. Omega equals 1.5. Let's make it closer to the other value. Okay, uh, let me make the time parameter longer. Okay, omega equals 1.5, that's something. Let me try 1.1. Okay. So there's still some weird behavior at the beginning, uh, which might be one of the reasons to, um, so, you know, looking at the transient behavior is so much uh, nicer. <laughs> because, uh, uh, so let's just do that. So we won't look at the uh, transient behavior and we'll just look at the stationary solution. What happens after a long time? We'll just do that. So what happens? after a long time. So when you compare this to, ah, okay, you can now begin to see something that uh, looks the same on both sides and you can compare them. So you can see that this one oscillation goes from 10 to minus 10. Uh, and here the oscillation amplitude is smaller. Uh, it goes from four, a little over four to a little under minus four. Um, and in fact, if I make omega larger, as I make omega larger and larger, this amplitude keeps going down. Like omega of three, yeah, omega of 10. Uh, and you know, these oscillation frequencies, they match the frequency that I'm putting in. It'll oscillate at the frequency that I'm driving it at. And um, with the changing frequency, what changes the amplitude? Because, uh, oh yeah, I don't even have to specify A anymore because um, we, are, we don't have um, amplitude as a parameter. Uh, we made that zero initially. So, um, okay, so omega equals one is some kind of a special value. Let's, uh, um, let's make it 
uh, smaller, uh, omega equals, I don't know, 0 0.9. And uh, it's getting smaller again. If, and as I make omega equals uh, even smaller values, now you can see that uh, your uh, period is increasing because of smaller frequency. So if you want to have some comparable looking thing, you have to kind of go farther out in time. And what you will see is that your amplitude will go down. And uh, what it is is uh, by accident, I picked a special value of omega. So the value of omega equals one, it's a special value because of this uh, expression for the natural frequency of oscillation with the uh, mass on a spring system. This is the natural frequency of oscillation, uh, square root of k over m. So in the, unit system that we picked by choosing k to be equal to one and m equal to one, um, the natural oscillation frequency is equal to one uh, radian per second. So uh, when we randomly picked one, we somehow uh, hit up on that uh, resonance frequency. So, so what this is showing is it's showing the phenomenon of resonance. So. I guess to plot uh, what your textbook shows as, what your textbook shows like this picture, it'll take a little bit of effort, so I won't. <laughs> but uh, maybe we can kind of uh, look at what this looks like from the other side. So they, they plotted these three things, small, medium, heavy damping, um, and uh, yeah, and so we had, um, yeah, so, uh, so if, uh, uh, let me just go one step lower and we'll say this is the uh, small damping. So with the small damping, we have this amount of, oh wait, it will further out in time to get stationary solution. Um, yeah, so with uh, this amount of damping, uh, with the amplitude we reach over time is 100. Okay, uh, let's, just try playing uh, with this thing. Wait one second. Where are my drawings? Um, so we are gonna get to the same parameter. So, so this is the moderate amount of damping already done before. <laughs> um, that's uh, uh, well, I guess ten times the damping, huh, ten times less. I wonder if I. Uh, make the damping even 10 times greater what we'll get. Uh, okay, somehow it's uh, inversely proportional, uh, you know, increase the damping by a factor of two. And it, yeah, at some point it will have this issue. And that issue goes all the way back to uh, what we are assuming when we came up with these uh, solutions. So I think up to two is where uh, we are still in the under them the case. So this uh, is kind of as much, as far as we can go without uh, violating the condition of this being uh, under them the case. Let's see what it looks like if it's a critical event. I haven't actually tried this out, so I don't know what the critical event case would look like. So this is the critical event. And I thought there was one more assumption we have to make for critical damping, yeah. Um, let's give it a try. Uh, I don't know overwrite. Um, let's see, oh. Can I, uh, I see, uh, I changed this to zero in the other version. Um, all right, it solved something. Uh, so if it's critically then the B has to be two. Like there's no other thing it can be. Um, let me have this go from. Okay, we still get this kind of oscillation. Um, uh, let's see what the transient behavior looks like from zero to 200 or sorry, 50. Oh. That's interesting. So uh, with the critical event case, uh, we reach our uh, stationary solution pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's within like two oscillations it gets there. 
And I think, um, I wonder how dependent on the frequency it is. So if I yeah, drive a lower frequency or at higher frequency, yeah, there, there isn't as much of a resonance anymore, I think. So let me see. So when I went to 0 0.5, the amplitude increased. Okay, let me see if I can go lower. Uh, oh no, there is a resonance, I think. Because um, when I was, no, I, I guess there is no resonance. So, um, so when I drive a super low frequency, <laughs> then um, then it reaches this uh, uh, maximum displacement. This is basically getting stuck at that uh, that position middle <laughs> gap, and and I think that's the maximum. And I, I don't think this really describes a resonance in the sense. So uh, with the critically damped case, the higher frequency you go, the smaller your oscillation is. What it comes down to is that your force against the damping force has uh, less time, less amount of time to accelerate it to the uh, or to displace it to the maximum displacement position. So that's why the more um, so so somehow I guess that resonance phenomenon it's uh, something that will only happen with um, that will only happen with uh, under them to case. Let me. Take a look at critically damped case just to see if it's uh, meaningfully different. So for critically damped case, this is now going to be less than zero. Um, and yeah, it still works. Oh, oh, yeah, this has to be bigger than two, right? So, uh, with the critically uh, with the over damped case, I don't think uh, it's all that different from critically damped case. I'm pretty sure I still don't have a uh, resonance phenomena. Like the higher frequency I go, the smaller amplitude. I get what it comes down to is that so the phenomenon of resonance is what happens when the oscillating system builds up energy over cycles of oscillation. And when you have critical or over damped case, basically the damping is taking out too much energy to cycle. So as you put in energy to cycle, uh, it's not gonna build up, as you can see. Um, with this oscillation at resonant frequency, like you have that one cycle, and that's where the energy will stay forever. Because each cycle, uh, basically, you are putting in the same amount of same amount of energy that you put in is getting taken out. Uh, unlike in the under damped case, when you had this uh, in the under damped case, you could build up energy over time and. In fact, the smaller the damping parameter, the lo over longer amount of time you would build up to a maximum amplitude. So, so yeah, this is the forced oscillation with the damping. And um, again, it's uh, mathematically quite challenging to deal with, which is why your textbook just uh, gives you the answers. <laughs> and with the, this is one of the uh, possible uses of computer algebra system. You can uh, use it to explore systems that are analytically challenging, and with the tools like plotting, you can um, you can um, visualize it. You can work it with it. Like you know, I'm not doing anything with this expression. You can work it with it in ways that are uh, not easy to do by hand. 